This conference will now be recorded. Excellent. Folks, we're uh, very pleased to be able to share uh, John McLean tonight and his expertise, not only in fishing, but in writing and in um, so many different things that you're going to become exposed to tonight after you hear him. Let me just do a little introduction of John. Uh, John Norman McLean is an award-winning author and journalist. He has spent 30 years at the Chicago Tribune. Most of that time was as the Washington correspondent. John was one of the Kissinger 14, uh, the journalists who regularly traveled with the Secretary of State Henry Kissinger during the era of shuttle diplomacy. After leaving Tribune, John wrote a series of nonfiction books about wildland fire, beginning with Fire on the Mountain, and they are considered a staple of fire literature. Also included were Fire and Ashes on the Front Line of American Wildfire, The 30 Mile Fire, a Chronicle of Bravery and Betrayal, The Esperanza Fire, Arson, Murder, and the Agony of Engine 57, River of Fire, The Rattlesnake Fire, and The Mission Boys. John's memoir, Home Waters, a Chronicle of Family in a River, has been hailed as a lyrical tribute to his home state of Montana and as a worthy follow to his father's novella, A River Runs Through It. John was seven years old when his father, Norman, took him on his first fishing trip. With a lunch packed by his mother, his father drove them to a feeder creek near their family cabin, built along the forested shores of Seely Lake in 1922 by his grandfather, the Reverend John McLean. The story of how he caught his first fish, a six inch rainbow trout before a short burst of hail erupted out of the clear summer skies is recounted in the first chapter of John's memoir, Home Waters. Uh, upcoming, John has written the foreword to a centennial edition of Ernest Hemingway's A Big Two-Hearted River, scheduled for publication um, by Mariner Classics on May 9th. So mark your calendars, fish lit lovers, and make sure you get a copy of that as soon as it comes out. John is an avid fly fisherman and divides his time between Washington, D.C. and a family cabin at Sealy Lake, Montana. Now. What I love about John's works is too long of a list to go into here, but I will praise two essential streams of John's opus um, of his writings, his great river of words. First is his depth, tirelessness, and clarity in researching and communicating massive amounts of information in ways that make sense, inspire, and challenge, particularly his tenacity at getting it right. Um, and this is best seen in his writings on wildfires and the critical placement and sequest sequencing of the events, right? This is so important to those narratives and it's made a huge difference in how people have learned from fire. Uh, second is his intentional decision to situate himself in the places he opens us up to in his works. Clearly nodding to the importance of place, John inserts himself into the historical landscape of fishing, Montana, the Big Blackfoot, Ketchum, Esperanza, the Tidal Basin, wherever. But he also inserts himself into the geologic interior terrain of our own human lives in such a way as to allow each of us to come along alongside of him and to enter into those same vistas. Like his father, Norman McLean, and Ernest Hemingway, whom they both loved, when you are digesting John's writings, you are given access to all he sees and all that he feels so that you too can feel the old feelings. The feelings of standing waist high in water, the feelings of bringing to hand great fish and great moments of life, the feelings of being one among many who walk this earth and hunger to know it fully. There can be no greater gift a writer may impart to his readers. Thank you, John. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John McLean. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, it was so pleasant listening to that, <laughs> but I'm not sure I can jump into what I want to say. Maybe I can. Um, you guys can see the uh, first slide there, I hope, of Home Waters, uh, the Blackfoot River. That isn't the only place I fish. I uh, love your state uh, and fish Penn's Creek when I can. I haven't been up there in a couple of years. Uh, but I like to fish it early and late. Uh, I don't like to fish it when it's combat fishing. 
uh, but there's some very, very great water in Pennsylvania and, and even down here uh, in Virginia, fish the Rapidam up in the Blue Ridge a lot. Uh, but the Blackfoot River is uh, where it all started. That photograph is uh, where the Cottonwood River uh, comes into the Blackfoot. It it's, would be as far upstream about as you can get on the left side. There's an aspen tree sticking up there right where the cottonwood comes in. And that scene uh, is very much the way it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Uh, it, it hasn't changed that much. That's the nature of the Blackfoot River, uh, both literally uh, because it is most of it is right up against uh, hard granite mountains so that the holes don't change, but also figuratively that it's a Blackfoot Valley. Uh, which runs from Bonner, Montana to the Rogers Pass, is one of the least molested uh, valleys uh, left in the state of Montana. And one reason for that is that the people who live there, all the way from the incomer millionaires uh, to the people who are selling beer and potato chips in Lincoln, uh, agree that they need to preserve it. And they have voted for that. They voted for uh, a bill that said you can't have a holding that is less than 165 acres, and preferably more than that. Uh, I have a friend whom I encourage to come in and, and buy a place there, uh, who now owns a little more than 165 acres. He's got eight miles of uh, stream exposure of Blackfoot River Bank uh, that he has accumulated over the years, and it's locked up in a family trust. He doesn't sell beer and potato chips. But to take them together, all of us working together uh, have held this thing together. If you can go to the next slide. Here we go. Come on. There we go. Uh, the fishing has, however, has changed a good deal. And I put it really into three separate blocks of time. Uh, the first being at the time when a river. Big Two-Hearted River was written uh, in Ernest Hemingway's book. It was first published in 1925. And I can claim a number of centennial years for that story. It was published in 25. He wrote it, most of it, in 24. And he started writing it, I believe, uh, in the fall of 1923. So pick your centennial year. Uh, our cabin there, uh, you can pick centennial years for it to pretty much match up to Big Two-Hearted River. The lease was taken out in 1921 on a national forest holding there. Uh, work started in 22. This year, centennial, uh, 1923, uh, they probably got a roof up uh, on the cabin, but it wasn't really done until 24. So there is a convergence there <laughs> of uh, Big Two-Hearted River and uh, the cabin that is still there. In 1925, Ernest Hemingway was fishing uh, with this kind of lousy uh, leader that was basically silk, and you had to keep it wet. Uh, he, he was not uh, a delicate fisherman. Uh, as he describes in Big Two Hearted River, he fished with grasshoppers. Uh, in Montana, my dad and his father and brother uh, fished with cheap bamboo uh, rods. They're, maybe 10 bucks a piece. Uh, the tips would break so regularly that at the hardware store in town, they had a big wooden barrel full of tips and you pick one out for a buck that would match uh, your rod. But I started I started with a metal rod, a horrible thing, and uh, with kinks in it and a reel that uh, ground around three times and stopped and it was really bad. So that was kind of a holdover uh, on that early stage of fishing. When I was a teenager, uh, things had begun to change a great deal, and we're all familiar with this. And there was the you know, late 1950s, uh, and Fenwick was a big name, and Wright McGill, and they did fiberglass rods. That was a great breakthrough. I still have got the first fiberglass rod that I ever uh, owned. My father gave it to me as a Christmas present, so Wright McGill, and I was just ecstatic about it. It was the, the great thing of the day. And uh, that's the one that I used in this slide where we went out and fished and fished uh, uh, over and over again, seldom if ever meeting anybody and kept what we, uh, what we caught. 
go to the next slide. Things began to change after that, of course. And when I quit the Chicago Tribune in 1995, uh, I'd fished in the interim uh, here in the East and uh, some in the West, but I'd never gone through what you have to go through to get into modern fishing. And in 1995, I had to learn fishing all over again. I'd learn all the equipment, uh, the, the new rods, uh, the reels. I always used an old metalist Luger. I still think they're wonderful reels. But you know, I got now I have a set of Ross Gunnison G series reels, and got into dry flies. Uh, right in the 60s, 50s and 60s, my dad would fish with a dry fly in the evening as a kind of a special thing, you know. And you'd, you'd get out this very nice bamboo rod that he'd won in a in a contest. But it was fishing with a dry fly was you know that was rare. Uh, most of the time, we fished with great big uh, wet flies that uh, imitated hoppers or sunken caddisflies or, or nymphs of one kind or another. Uh, and that's what you did. Uh, you had those flies and got to care of it. And when I talk about fishing 31 days in a row. I mean, honest to God, I was trying to remember earlier today, did we ever see anybody else fishing during those 31 days? No, I can't remember seeing anybody. We probably did. Uh, did we throw back a fish of the keeper size? We did not. We kept everything we uh, caught. And we wound up with a freezer full of these milk cartons where you'd put the fish in, cut the heads off, put the fish in and fill it up with water and freeze them. And we had to give away fish, but we certainly wouldn't throw them back. Now, all that cha has changed now, uh, where we've got all this high tech stuff. Uh, the rod companies all have thousand dollar rods that are pretty much alike <laughs> and they're wonderful. Uh, one rod company in particular has invented a rod that elderly rich bankers can use who know nothing about fishing and can make a pretty decent cast. I won't mention the name of the company. Uh, next slide. I included this slide because it's a beautiful uh, hole uh, on the Blackfoot, but also because uh, of that rock. Uh, that rock has seen the rear ends of four generations of McLeans. <laughs> I will swear to you that my grandfather, father, my uncle Paul, myself, and both my sons have put our butts on that rock and watched for a fish to rise in this very beautiful uh, dry fly hole, evening hole uh, on the Blackfoot. Next slide. Blackfoot River uh, is an ancient adjunct to a Native American interstate highway, uh, the road to the Buffalo. Uh, the road to the Buffalo started actually on north of Missoula along the Clark Fork River. And it proceeded down the Clark Fork, struck the, uh, the Blackfoot at what is now Bonner, uh, followed and the, the Mullen Road then was built basically uh, where the, the road to the Buffalo uh, had carved a path. And then it proceeded from Bonner uh, using the river as a parallel. And I mean, it's a feeder road. Uh, there are little trails coming in from the north uh, uh, as tribal people move toward the Buffalo Plains east of the Continental Divide. They usually did this twice a year. Uh, I've learned in, in my research. Uh, they did it in the winter as well as the summer, and they needed to do it because they were a buffalo culture. That's what they lived off of, and the stuff doesn't last forever. Uh, so they had to go back and replenish it. That would have been a really brutal trip uh, in the winter. They were accompanied at one point by a Jesuit missionary who uh, records it. You could wish that he was less religious than he is because he goes into how he converted somebody instead of going into what it was like to march with the Indians. But uh, the drawing, the wood engraving there on the upper left gives you a very good idea uh, of what that was like. It started out, uh, of course, with dogs uh, before they had horses. Uh, then the travels came through. There are places today where you can find the old road to the Buffalo. And I found several of them uh, in the course of doing home waters. 
uh, was introduced to them by local historians uh, that are not well documented by the formal Lewis and Clark historians. Lewis and, and a small party were the first white men to go through the Blackfoot Valley on the return journey of the expedition in 1806. Uh, that's when they split up and Clark went down, down to Clark Fork uh, to the Yellowstone and Lewis went through the Blackfoot Valley. Uh, the, you can follow that road, a lot of it today, simply by driving Route 200 uh, through the Blackfoot Valley. Route 200, the Mullen Road was built on, uh, was built to be part of it, but it was a pretty easy follow. It's, take a look at that photograph. <laughs> there isn't a whole lot of question about how you're going to get from A to B. You go in a straight line. And that is true through a lot of the valley. Uh, the valley is much narrower uh, farther down. And you can stand in a place where probably the horses uh, and the men of the Lewis expedition uh, went through. You'll be within 15 feet of uh, a footmark. Right? I'm told that people who re do the recreations of the, uh, of the Lewis and Clark expedition always get that question. How can I stand exactly where Lewis and Clark were? Well, take Route 200 and you're doing a pretty good job. Get out and walk uh, through some of it on a natural pathway and you'll get even more of it. It's uh, kind of wonderful. Uh, there's a, as a consequence of my having written an entire chapter about the road to the Buffalo uh, in home waters, there has been a great interest in it. Uh, and there's been follow up and additional things have been found uh, part of it by a very good friend of mine, Tim Brigaman, who is a retired uh, reporter for the Missoulian. And in the next couple of days, he's going to be leading a, uh, a tour of the road to the Buffalo starting uh, in the Vitterate Valley at Traveler's Rest, the place where Lewis and Clark stopped on the way out, stopped on the way back, and the place from which Lewis and his small party uh, commenced their trip uh, that wound up going through the Blackfoot Valley over the Continental Divide and out on the plains. Next slide. That's the cabin. Uh, cabins, uh, log cabins normally have a life of about 100 years, and this one is 100 years old. We have poured linseed oil and turpentine onto that thing over the decades, and it's in very good shape. Uh, we're doing a, a restoration project that has become eternal. I hope we get it done this year, but we may not of an ice house that was built as part of the, our compound there. Uh, the ice house is in very bad shape. It's very simple. Uh, there's no caulking. There's no foundation. It's a 14er, you know the term. Uh, it's a square, 14 feet on each side, just like a lookout tower. And we're kind of trying to bring that back. And I'm doing everything I can to, to try to keep this thing going and pass it on to my kids and my sister's kids. and uh, cousins who live in Montana and shape where it can, you know, it's going to last as long as I do for sure, but maybe we can get another, I don't know how much longer. I don't want to even think about that. But it's a beautiful cabin in situ. We thought about taking it and putting it over at the Historical Society, and it, it, it wouldn't work uh, outside of where it is. It's, it's in a, a glorious place. It's surrounded by these gigantic Western Larch, uh, it's a perfect setting. Next slide, please. Okay, Ernest Hemingway's Big Two Hearted River, uh, that book cover is on the right hand side, uh, comes out May 9th, and that really is the, it's the last to be done, but it's the first of a series. Uh, all the books on the left, my father's two and my six, would not have been written the way they are without Big Two-Hearted River. That was the one that broke the ice on American writing for people like us who love the outdoors, um, love writing, uh, and want to recreate something of what it means to be outdoors uh, and, and beyond to a big fish. Uh, is it just a, a sports story? Me and Joe went out and we caught a bunch of trout, yeah, yeah. Or is it literature? Can it be literature? And Big Two-Hearted River proves that fish fly fishing can be literature. 
And my father was very aware of that uh, long before I came along and passed it along to me when I was about 13 years old. And he said, here, try this one. And I read it and it was a revelation because what we had been doing in Montana could be recreated on the page. You could feel the same things. Uh, and that had a profound effect on me. Uh, I always wanted to be able to do the same thing myself and kept trying. <laughs> it had a profound effect on my father who uh, wrote uh, River Runs Through It, which owes a great deal to Hemingway and specifically uh, Big Two Hearted River. The style opened things up for people who wanted American simplicity to mean something, not just dumb simplicity, but profound, piercing simplicity. Uh, and Hemingway did that. Uh, all my other books, all his books, uh, show uh, the scars of that and the fissures uh, and the imitations of it that sunk in over the years. The later Hemingway uh, is a different story. I stick with this early Hemingway. Uh, when he was a Midwestern boy in his early 20s uh, and still had his home waters in Michigan. Uh, next slide, please. This is the, uh, the Reverend's family with Clara Davidson, his uh, English wife, we're not all Scots, uh, and the two boys. Uh, there's the mention here that uh, John the favorite was a dry fly fisherman. And I've wondered about that because I don't know how much the Reverend fished with dry flies. I'm not sure he did. Uh, I know my father didn't fish with them much at all. Uh, I suspect that Paul never fished with dry flies. Uh, he was a meat hunter and he had George Kuhnenberg's flies and that's what he used. Their idea of a dry fly, I think was a cork grasshopper, something big and uh, corky or yarny that would ride on top of the water, which is, you know, okay, that's one definition of dry fly. Uh, but they were fishing great big six, eight uh, num uh, number hooks and uh, big wraps on them. That's what Kuhnenberg's flies are. That picture in the lower uh, right hand uh, side of the, of the image there, those are all the flies mentioned in A River Runs Through It, taken from my father's fly box with one exception. And it would be on the bottom row, second from the right. You can see it's kind of a streamer looking thing. That's the bobcat special, which is in a river runs through it. And it scared fish into biting them. <laughs> and when I was looking for these flies, because I was gonna take them out and make this little collection, I went to George Kuhnerberg who tied most of them. And I said, George, I can't find anything that I can identify as a bobcat special. He said, oh, okay, John, that was just a thing I started tying when I was a kid and I just a bunch of feathers and a cork. And I went on to tie the, the cork grasshopper, which is a much advanced version of that. He said, I don't think there are any of them around. He said, I certainly don't have any. I said, would you tie me a couple? And he did, and uh, that is one of them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the flies on the right on those two uh, uh, pages are bunion bugs. I have a pretty good collection. Uh, I know his Paul Bunyan's uh, grandson who tied flies based on the pattern for many years. I have a lot of those and I have a lot of original bunion bugs. The bunion bug is in A River Runs Through It. It was big and flashy and the first thing I picked out of my fly box. Uh, it's a great big thing. There are a number of uh, different ties. Some of them are small and exquisite, but there's a great big salmon fly one that is the bunion bug. And uh, the, it does look like an October caddis and it looks like a mattress. And it was originally intended to catch bass. And Paul Bunyan, uh, the fly tire, a Missoula fly tire, discovered that big fish loved it. And so he started uh, tying it for that. And, had a business going and uh, would tie the flies and 
give the pattern to his wife and to other women, and they would do all the uh, the renditions of it. You know, they were the volume tires, and he would make rods. And he was a very colorful guy. He would ride around Missoula on a pogo stick. He was kind of an early hippie. Uh, and some of his rods are very fanciful. They look like barber poles. They've got peppermint colors going up and down. He had a lot of fun, but he was also very, uh, a very fine craftsman, a good one. The flies on the left are George Kunenberg's flies. He used to send them to me in these handmade boxes, and I threw one or two of them away, uh, talking about being stupid, and then finally realized that these are you know, really wonderful things. They're handmade, and uh, you put a little uh, card in there saying that done by uh, George Kunenberg's tied by my hand. Nice stuff. Uh, next slide, please. This is the family. The Reverend and uh, Mrs. McLean are off to the left in black uh, at the manse uh, in Missoula, across from the First Presbyterian Church. They didn't live there very long. The Presbyterians realized that it was a valuable property and sold it. <laughs> and the Reverend and Mrs. McLean wound up in smaller digs, but uh, never complained about it. Uh, this is a church group of some kind. He started there in 1909. He loved the place. Uh, he left briefly to live in Helena uh, and be the administrator of the Synod for Montana and Wyoming. It's kind of like being a bishop in the uh, Presbyterian's version of a bishop. And as soon as he had finished with that, he hightailed it back to Missoula, uh, where he finished out his life. Next slide. Uh, this plaque was put up in front of the uh, First Presbyterian Church in uh, 2009. I was there for it. Uh, glad to be there. And it's a memory of, uh, of the pastor uh, with whom I share a name of uh, the beginning of his uh, ministry. Uh, you look on the left and see some snow there. I woke up in the cabin at Seely Lake that morning, 55 miles away and looked at the uh, thermometer and it was 10 degrees below zero in October. Uh, I was there last October and it was in the 70s and 80s. So whatever that may mean, I hope it doesn't mean too much. Next slide, please. The boys grew up in Missoula. Uh, this photograph appeared in a book of pictures about Missoula. Nobody knew who they were until somebody said, hey, I know those guys. That's the McLean boys, that's Norman and Paul. And indeed it is. This photograph was taken by the wife uh, of uh, a famous architect uh, in Missoula who was a very good family friend. And if you look at 1911, uh, if you're like architecture and the beauty of architecture, those are beautiful buildings. And if you look at the scene today, they're ugly buildings. <laughs> they couldn't be plainer. I mean, we haven't gone forward. Uh, in some ways over time. Next slide, please. Paul is a handsome fella and a good uh, basketball player and a good football player and made his way through uh, Missoula County High School, Sentinel High, and uh, spent his first two years in college at the University of Montana. There wasn't enough money to send both boys east my father went to Dartmouth, uh, but uh, my dad got a job as uh, editor of the jack o -Lantern. And after he uh, became affluent as, as a consequence, um, Paul was able to join him there. I mean, the job as editor paid a lot of money. Uh, next slide, please. Doing the book, uh, Home Waters, uh, brought up a lot of things that I hadn't known uh, as I did research on my family, including these two photographs uh, of Paul. That's Paul fishing on the Blackfoot on the left, and I know exactly where that hole is. Uh, it's about a mile and a half above Scotty Brown's Bridge, a mile and a quarter. And I don't know where he caught that fish on the right, but I suspect that it was in the Clark Fork because that's not uh, so much a Blackfoot fish. Uh, when I was growing up, I never saw a fish in the Blackfoot over three pounds, three and a half pounds. That changed 
once they took out the dam at the confluence of the Blackfoot and Clark Fork, there was a big dam there that prevented the fish from going up the Clark Fork, from the Clark Fork up the Blackfoot. And after they took that dam out on a super fun cleanup, uh, the fish in the Blackfoot got a lot bigger. Next slide, please. That's Paul looking tough on the left, which he was. Uh, and that's the report of his death uh, in Chicago. He didn't, uh, he wasn't in Chicago even for a full year. Uh, he had a very good journalism job. He worked for the Helena paper with the cap in the capital as the uh, political correspondent, the chief political correspondent, covering the sessions uh, of the legislature every other year and was by all reports uh, highly respected and feared. Uh, he was a fearsome uh, presence. Uh, but he was also a gambler and he drank and he got in a lot of trouble and in debt and was moved by his family uh, to Chicago where he worked on the public relations staff of the University of Chicago, a job my dad got. And he tried to get into newspapers and uh, they were not impressed with uh, his years as a provincial journalist. He was uh, killed in 1938. Uh, and I believe that the account I give of it in Home Waters is accurate as to the events of that night. Uh, I think that there are things that happened before that that I don't report uh, that had an impact on that. I think that there was an awful lot of pressure on him. He'd gotten in trouble again on in debts and so on. And on the day of his death, it was Sunday, uh, he had a very conventional day. He took his girlfriend to a White Sox game, came back, they had dinner at the one good restaurant in Hyde Park in Chicago, Morton's. And he walked her home, no hanky-panky. And at 10 o'clock, 10, 15, he left her and was going to walk across the midway to his digs. And it worked the next morning. Monday, he's coming up. And instead of that, uh, he wound up uh, trying to start a fight with a couple of people. There are eyewitness accounts of that and uh, full of booze and uh, was beaten to death. Uh, that photograph uh, is not of Paul. That photograph of, is of my father and it just enraged my dad. He said, you want to know why we left Montana? The goddamn people at his own newspaper couldn't get a photo, the right photograph of him when he got killed. It stuck mine in there. Uh, unhappy thing. Next photo, next, please. Uh, my dad was, his nickname was Preacher when he was uh, growing up because he liked to declaim. He wanted to be like his father. He got up in front of a crowd and uh, mesmerized him, and he wound up doing it. He was a mesmerizing teacher uh, at a university that did not value teaching, that valued scientific research and other kinds of scholarship. And he was not a great scholar but he was a great teacher. Kids would uh, take sleeping bags to registration the night before, and they would sleep out in order to be in line to get into his classes. Uh, I attended his classes and I'll tell you, he held you, uh, really knew how to do it. So they may have joked so of his talking, uh, but it wasn't a joke, uh, he knew how to do it. Next slide, please. He wanted all his life to be a writer, uh, and he tried it, and he tried poetry, and here he won uh, a poetic contest, a sixth place. Carl Sandburg was one of the uh, judges, which sort of pleased him. He, <laughs> he could get a little rough, you know, and he said, Carl Sandburg, that dumb Swede. Yeah. But he was happy to have won the prize. Uh, he tried all his life to write. Uh, and his father had been so harsh about, you know, bring it back at half the length. Uh, saying that to him over and over again, condense it, condense it, condense it. But I think it gave him a bad case of writer's block. Uh, I know he did it to me and it took me a while to get, uh, to get rid of it. Uh, I got rid of it earlier because I got into writing, writing for a newspaper. Uh, but it, 
it isn't necessarily a great thing to have that be the what's mainly told you make it shorter you know how about dealing with it as an accordion that's what i try to tell writers you stretch it out and then you punch it together and eliminate the nonsense and the bs get rid of that stuff uh, then look at the rhythm and as my father once said you know why not put a little poetry in it he was not a poet who wrote poetry well but he wrote prose poetically and very well. Next slide, please. Now you can see that he had this elegant manner, kind of tough elegance, uh, in a very Spartan uh, university. You know, there'd be a blackboard and the, the eraser there in front of him and an open book and gesture and presence. That's what counted. Uh, didn't do PowerPoint programs. That's the University of Chicago, medieval architecture. I love it. Wonderful. Next slide, please. This is my mom. My mother was wonderful. Uh, she was a tomboy, and her nickname was uh, Jakey. Uh, she had long, beautiful auburn hair, but when she got married and started having children, she cut it short, and uh, her yearbook book is to cause a disturbance is to be happy. She was the great realist in the family. Um, she was Paul's best friend. Uh, they could talk in a way that was freer than uh, Paul could talk to his brother. Uh, she had an unbelievable ability to connect with people. I mean, it was like being hit with a sledgehammer almost. I mean, it had a real physical impact, her empathy. And she had marvelous friends. She worked at the University of Chicago uh, in different jobs, uh, mainly in the medical division, in fact, entirely in the medical division, and had a group of women who were around her who were delegated to secondary tasks, uh, even though they had lots of degrees and did wonderful things, uh, which they did and invented stuff that other people took the credit. So she was an early feminist. I never felt antagonism from that, from her. Um, she wanted women to be recognized for their value and their merit. Uh, and she wasn't out to, you know, whack a, the guys over the head. But some of her best friends were men. Next slide, please. This is where she grew up. This is my grandfather, John Henry Burns' general store uh, on the left in Wolf Creek, Montana. It's still there today. That's it on the right. If you guys have fished the Missouri River and gone to Wolf Creek, uh, you may have had dinner there or stopped by uh, for a steak and a beer or whatever. Uh, it's still there. It's uh, That's the one he built uh, out of a Sears uh, catalog. He ordered the store and it arrived on a rail truck and uh, they put it in there. That didn't hit me until few years ago when a store I visit regularly in Philemont, Virginia, in the Piedmont country, uh, I realized looked exactly like my grandfather's store. And I said to the young guy, wonderful young guy who owns it, he's made it historic and brought things back. It's a real store. I said, Did this, is this a Sears store? He said, yeah, it is. <laughs> they'd order these things and they'd arrive and put them up and away you go. Next slide. That's George Quinnenberg, who was our great family friend. He was Paul's best friend for a while. He was my father's deep friend. Uh, he was my best friend, uh, my mentor. I uh, gave the eulogy when he died. Uh, absolutely wonderful man. I described him pretty fully in uh, Home Waters. Interesting uh, photograph on the right. George was tall. My father was not. They would go to these mountain lakes and it's tricky fishing because as you can see, the lake is ringed with timber. So you can't stand on the bank and cast. You have to get out there some way. If you look at George's legs, you can see he didn't have to get very wet to get out far enough to cast because he's tall and powerful. If you look at my father's legs, he had to get way out there 
so his stubby little form could uh, uh, get a fly out where the fish were. Next slide, please. That's me uh, in front of the cabin with a fish, a bass. And that's me when I started getting back to, uh, to fishing in the 90s. <laughs> I'm holding the rod along, wrong, if you'll notice. I've got my forefinger instead of my thumb on. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, you can do delicate casting with that forefinger up there. And I was getting into dry fly fishing. Next slide, please. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's my favorite time of year there. Uh, late September, October. Uh, the aspen and the cottonwood are the first to go. Uh, the larch comes later, but it's all yellow. And you know, like somebody took a gold ingots and melted them down and sprayed them all over the forest. Marvelous. Next slide. Okay, there's up on the upper left, there's two rainbows. Uh, the rainbow over the river and then down on the lower right is the biggest rainbow trout I ever saw in the Blackfoot River. And I swear he spent part of his life in the Clark Fork. Uh, that's as big as a salmon, seven, eight, eight and a half pounds, something like that. Uh, and Blackfoot just did not produce fish of anywhere near that size. Uh, for a long time. The Blackfoot today fishes better than it did when I was a kid, thanks to a river runs through it, uh, Trout Unlimited, uh, and the Blackfoot Challenge, and the people who lived there. When the money started pouring in after the movie A River Runs Through It came out, it was channeled through local groups, the Blackfoot Challenge and uh, TU. And what they did was go to local people and say, look, we'd like to come on your ranch and meander that tributary and bring it back so it isn't just a sluice box anymore. Here's what we plan to do. And by the way, Jim, uh, I'll see you in church on Sunday. I mean, it was that kind of close relationship. And Jim would say, okay, I guess you can go ahead. And then he'd see what they were doing. So it seems to me like you guys need a couple of timbers in there, shore up that bank. I got some in my barn, I'll go get them. That's how it worked. And it worked. Uh, today, the problem is overfishing, uh, overuse of the resource. But with catch and release, the fish counts high. But the state of Montana has become stupid -er at the political level than normal. Uh, it's never been a particularly enlightened uh, administration, but it was always by a bipartisan issue that you would keep the wildlife and the wild places and the fishing going. Uh, you do what you had to do there. And it isn't like that anymore. It's let's, how can we rape the resource? And somebody like Steve Daines, the Senator leads that as does Gianforte and Zinke. And it's deeply ignorant and wrong and not Montana. That said, fish counts good. When they get 50 to 125 rigs going in at the same place on the Blackfoot River. Look at it, isn't that big a river? On a single day, and they're unwilling to do anything to stem that flow except build more parking areas. Next slide, please. And a lot of what the Blackfoot was is still there, more than any river, lake, or stream. My father loved the Blackfoot River. Most of all, at dusk, when fish rise and old memories surface. From those and countless other times, he caught the unspoken words and rhythms of the river. And in time, and in his own words, passed them on. Next slide. Mm 
Next slide. Next slide. And the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, John. Let me exit from the slide presentation. You may exit. Me, uh, share. There you go. I can stop sharing. And then, yeah, okay. We can see you. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Folks? I'm just curious. I have two flies in it all. Uh, two bunion bugs. One made by Norman McLean. The other one by Richard Rose. Who exactly is Richard Rose? Richard Rose is uh, Paul Bunyan's grandson. Uh, and he's still alive and still tying. Uh, he had a website for a while. I think he still may. He lived in Montana for a while, and uh, I knew him well there. Uh, he had a place on the Blackfoot, and he tried to make a business out of it, and there just wasn't enough there uh, to keep it going. I mean, you, bunion bugs go for a, a real bunion bug made by the original master, Paul. Uh, it goes for an awful lot of money if it's in great shape. You know, uh, I'm almost ashamed to say so I sold one once uh, that was one of the first ones ever tied for $1,000. And I only did it because I, I needed the dough to finish a book. <laughs> and I had one just like it, so it wasn't, I wasn't giving everything away. Uh, so that's if you've got uh, Norman Means was actually the name of, the, of Paul Bunyan. And uh, he was from the East and came out to the University of Montana where he studied uh, fish etymology and got very interested in it, loved the fishing, uh, got into it, and wound up making a business out of it. There was a group of fly tires uh, who met in a bar. Uh, the bar owner had a part of the bar set aside for fly tires. Uh, <laughs> not a combination that is unheard of. Uh, and uh, Jack Beamy was one of them. He was probably the best of them. Uh, he was a champion caster. Uh, he won a contest in the early part of the 20th century for distance at 125 feet. And I, I talked to uh, one of the guys who was one of the fishing consultants on a river run through it about that. And he said, that, that is all you could do with the tackle of that day. 125 feet, you maxed it. That was it. And Beamy tied a, a quill fly that was very similar to the one George Kuhnerberg tied. And that's where George learned it. George would go to the bar and he'd watch these guys tie. Uh, Potts was there, you know, Potts flies are famous. Uh, and what George did was to add to the body of that fly so it got fat, big and fat. I still use those. The yellow quill is a dynamite fly. It's just a yellow body with a yarn interior and a quill exterior. Uh, hackle and uh, uh, and wings, uh, turkey wings on it, and it will work when nothing else will work. But I'm really frustrated. And, you know, there's nothing going on the surface and uh, or anywhere else. I toss one of those things in, and you know, pretty soon you get a fish. I took my editor <laughs> from Mariner Classics uh, fishing on the Blackfoot, and he he had tried to learn the sport in the East, gotten some lessons and so on, but he's a he was not a guy who was steeped in fishology. Okay, so I put him up at the head of a hole with a yellow quill, and he didn't know to move. He thought you just keep casting, right? And he, after about 20 minutes, he ties into this monster cutthroat on the yellow quill, and made me a hero. Uh, wonderful. <laughs>
John, what are your thoughts on the movie A River Runs Through It? Uh, I'm a fan. Uh, I realize that a lot of fly fishermen are not. The book is better than the movie. Okay, uh, I agree. I'll tell you what I like about the movie. I like a lot of things about it. I like Montana. Uh, you know, it won the Academy Award for Cinematography. <clears throat> it is a movie a whole family can watch together. And nobody is insulted. Children identify with Paul. They like him. They know that you can't behave the way he did and get away with it. And when the unfortunate happens, it happens off screen. They do not have to witness it. There is plenty of adult content in that movie. I know people who've watched it over and over again and worn out DVDs over and over again. They love it. So that's why I like it. It's a family movie. I am often asked, what would your father say about it? You know what, all this happened posthumously. Uh, the movie was made after he was gone. Young Men and Fire was published after he was gone. His greatest days came after he was gone. And I will tell you that he would have found things to complain about. Uh, and he did with some of the early scripts. In fact, one early one just stopped him. He got a script from <laughs> written by someone who I won't name, who was a pompous ass, uh, and thought he knew more about the McLeans than the McLeans did. And he wrote this script, and it opens up with Paul on a dock at Sealy Lake, casting and catching a great big rainbow. And he pulls the rainbow in and holds it up and boom, breaks its neck <laughs> to kill it. My father read that, and we had to scrape him off the ceiling. <laughs> and that stopped him. I mean, he became enraged. And Redford was wise enough to know, having given away a creative veto to my father, this never happens in Hollywood. And that was in the contract. If Norman said no, it wasn't going to be made. Having given that away, he just said, okay. The work on the film that came to be started immediately after my father's death. You can fill in the blanks yourself <laughs> on how that happened. And he waited him out. So. And he was right. I'm sorry, he was right. Uh, I think Redford did a wonderful job. And I know that that, that isn't the the high-end fishing attitude toward it. That movie's still around. People still love it. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. You, you mentioned that Trout Unlimited and other organizations and groups did some improvement work on the on the on the river. Um, is it primarily a wild trout fishery or? or does the state of Montana um, stock that stream system? Uh, to find wild trout, it, uh, it doesn't meet the standards of the native fish purists because there are brown trout in it and there are rainbow trout in it. Uh, when Lewis went through there in 1806, it was a cutthroat, West Slope cutthroat, uh, not even grayling in it at the time. Uh, white fish and bull trout, those were the predominant species. Those fish are all still there. Uh, in the late 1800s, uh, as you probably know, uh, fish were imported from Europe uh, and brought out by railroad trains. When the railroad lines opened up, that's when brown trout were spread uh, across the country. Uh, the rainbow were put in there uh, and were stocked early on. but. There is an argument that there were native rainbow on the east side uh, uh, of the uh, Lolo, Mountain, Lolo Pass kind of mountains, not on the east side of the, of the Continental Divide, but in that valley uh, that they had migrated on as eggs on the legs of ducks and migratory waterfowl. And they had made it over the hump into drainages that would have drained into the Blackfoot. And that there is some argument for that. I, 
this all bothers me, frankly. They have stocked it from time to time. And they've stopped doing that pretty much, if not entirely. Uh, what they did at one time, I thought was crazy, was they stocked a different strain of cutthroat. And now they've been able to go back to the native uh, cutthroat. And that has become over the last several years, last five, 10 years, uh, much more a predominant species uh, in the Blackfoot. I used to be able to start at the tail end of a hole where it was nice and soft and catch a cutthroat and get into the middle of the hole and catch a cut bow and then get up to the head in the hard water and catch a rainbow. And you can still do that. Uh, it isn't gone. The brown trout, I think, are a permanent forever presence. People who sneer at them and say they should just be a cutthroat fishery. Come on, they've been over there, there for over 100 years. Uh, they're a wonderful game fish. Uh, we used to sneer at them, we didn't like them, but that's wrong. I mean, they're as firm in flesh as the other fish when the water is cold. So, oh, they're kind of mushy, they're same issue. Yeah, they don't taste very good. Well, we don't eat them anymore. And they fight like hell. Uh, What's the matter with them? And they're in different water. Uh, semi non-competitor. And you're, you're getting these fish now, you go down there and have a good day. You know, you're getting 20, 22 inch browns and rainbow and cut, cut throw it up around 20 inches. I mean, we never saw that uh, when I was a kid. So why force this thing? Why force the rainbow out of there? The rainbow was the Blackfoot fish when I grew up. That's the legacy there. So very little, if not, almost no stocking. They've done enormous work on the tributaries. Uh, and that's, of course, the cutthroat. Uh, the browns come up too, uh, but it's mainly made the cutthroat a highly viable uh, population. It's much more numerous uh, in terms of percentage than when I was a kid. Thank you. Uh, you don't catch uh, stockies. You don't catch stockies there. That's what you're asking. No, you don't catch stockies. Okay. The, the you're catching Colorado. fish that, that, that were born there. Call that a wild fish or a native fish? I don't know. That gets into theology. Colorado, Wyoming, Montana have an awful lot of eastern brook trout that we'd like to have back. <laughs> but we haven't figured out a good way to do that yet. So, um, well, speaking of non-competing uh, species, uh, the brook trout are, I love them. Uh, they don't love them in Montana. You can kill them and get rid of these things. Uh, but I think they're, first of all, very beautiful fish, uh, but they occupy water that is, they're not taking it away from anybody. Uh, yeah, they'll mix in with the cutthroat and nice soft water, uh, but they like that dead quiet stuff. Uh, yeah, they think that they made a big mistake moving them in. And that is the fish that is sneered at. But I fished enough in the East uh, and fished enough to really like them. I mean, I think they're great. If we could resurrect them by freeze drying them and flying them East and stocking them, <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd take it. <laughs> well, you know, the brook trout have been driven off the, off the Piedmont. Uh, they were once the dominant fish in the East, and they were out there uh, all up and down the Rappahannock and the Susquehanna and all the rest of them. Uh, and they're not there anymore. They're up there in the little creeks in the mountains, which is where I go after them. And, you know, I, I think I once caught an 11 inch brook trout in the Rapidan. <laughs> you know, monster. Uh, my bucket list is to go up to Newfoundland or someplace and catch a two pound brook trout. But that isn't fair. That isn't. No, you know, I mean, my, maybe my uh, list should have a, another 11 inch uh, brook trout in the rapid end. <laughs> I'm going the end of this month for three or four days. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Well, let's give John a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time and uh, look forward to the Hemingway book coming out and uh, 
we urge everyone to go on Amazon and uh, purchase a book. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Thank you, guys. I will. All right, I'm out of here. I'll let you have your meeting. Yep. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> and this session.